The Kinkora Boys Home Scandal centred around a notorious home for boys in Belfast, Northern Ireland, that was the scene of a disgraceful child sex abuse ring in the 1970s and 80s. And, many believe, an equally disgraceful cover-up by the authorities Despite the setting up of the Northern Ireland Historical Institutional Abuse Inquiry, or HIA, in May 2016, rumours and allegations persist that high-ranking members of the establishment from around Britain and Ireland were heavily involved and shielded from justice. Kincora Boys Home was established in 1958 as a haven for teenagers from difficult backgrounds. According to boys who were abused there, crimes began almost as soon as it opened and continued unabated until it closed in 1980. Stories of abuse first broke publicly on the 24th of January that year with a story in the Irish Independent. Jerry Fitt, at the time the SDLP MP for West Belfast, raised the issue in Westminster, demanding to know why no investigations and prosecutions had taken place, despite allegations about Kincora being passed to the police as early as 1977. The Royal Ulster Constabulary had in fact investigated and passed a report to the Director of Public Prosecutions, yet nothing was done. By the 3rd of April 1980, Three members of staff at the home, William McGrath, Raymond Semple and Joseph Maines, were charged with a number of offences relating to the sexual abuse of children in their care over a number of years. All were convicted for four, five and six years respectively. But many were suspicious. Why had the report been buried for three years by the government? Why were three staff members abruptly charged and convicted as soon as the scandal surfaced? Were they sacrificed to protect others? Author Martin Dillon, in his book The Dirty War, alleged that McGraw was connected to MI5 via loyalist paramilitaries. The potential involvement of MI5 raised two equally repulsive possibilities that they were squashing investigations into Kinkora to protect members of the establishment, or that they were luring members of the establishment into Kinkora to compromise and blackmail them. The satirical current affairs magazine, Private Eye, also alleged that high-ranking members of the Whitehall Civil Service and senior officers of the British military were involved in the sexual abuse of boys at Kinkora. There's lots more to come in this video, but please consider liking, subscribing to the channel, and sharing. And please consider supporting my work with a PayPal donation. The link is in the description. Thank you. Northern Ireland Secretary James Pryor, the British government minister responsible for the province, set up two separate inquiries. The first was not public, but collapsed when three members resigned because they were unhappy with the standard of the RUC's investigation. A second, public inquiry, under Judge William Hughes, was set up in January 1984. Its 355-page report, released in December 1985, was mainly procedural. But he also said the events were not, quote, exceptional, and, quote, symptoms of a general malaise permeating the United Kingdom. This was seen as an oblique reference to allegations of establishment involvement and cover-ups, which Hughes was unable to directly examine for lack of evidence. Allegations rumbled on until April 1990, when author Robin Bryans alleged in the Dublin-based magazine Now that Lord Mountbatten, Anthony Blunt, and others were all involved in an old boy network which held gay orgies in country houses on both sides of the Irish border, as well as at Kincora Boys Home. He began a letter-writing campaign to the British establishment, 
making many stinging allegations, but was forced to desist when the police warned him that he could be prosecuted for criminal libel. Over the years, a whole raft of nobility, MPs, policemen, civil servants, and businessmen have been linked with Kinkora or related scandals. It would be unfair to name any of them, since most are dead, but it breathed new life into the allegations that Kinkora was at the centre of a prostitution ring. In the summer of 2014, two former military intelligence officers, Colin Wallace and Brian Gemmell, made separate allegations. Wallace alleged that he had received intelligence in 1973 regarding crimes at the home, but superior officers buried it. Gemmell said he had also discovered the abuse while monitoring loyalist paramilitaries, but was warned off by superiors. Both men asserted that the whole truth would never emerge unless intelligence services information on Kinkora was declassified. Former residents who were abused have been vocal about the abuse they suffered, especially after the wave of allegations that followed the unmasking of Jimmy Savile as one of the worst paedophiles in British history. The victims were particularly upset that the HIA inquiry did not enjoy the same powers as the parallel independent inquiry into child sexual abuse in England and Wales. That inquiry could compel witnesses to testify and demand that security services documents be handed over. But in 2016, Gary Hoy, a former resident of Kinkora, lost a UK Supreme Court challenge to the powers of the HIA. The final HIA report in 2017 dismissed any notion of an establishment cover-up, although it did at least recommend swift compensation of £100,000 each to the victims. The report's conclusion that the abuse was limited to only three staff members seems inconceivable, given the abuse networks of the 1970s and 80s that were exposed in the rest of the UK during the Operation U-Tree investigation. Whether the lurid tales of high-ranking establishment figures being involved are true or not, there were surely more abusers at Kinkora who got away with their evil crimes. For the former residents who live with the legacy of abuse, and those of them who took their own lives because of it, it seems that the whole truth will never be known, and that they will never get the justice they so surely deserve. The Lynmouth flood disaster took place overnight on the 15th to the 16th of August 1952 and mainly affected the village of Lynmouth in North Devon, England. Heavy rains caused mudslides that would sweep 34 residents to their deaths. In recent years, theories have circulated that suggested the Lynmouth disaster was not a natural one. The storm that hit Lynmouth that night was as epic as it was unseasonal and affected nearly all of southwest England. An extraordinary nine inches of rain fell over just 24 hours, believed to be the result of a cold front meeting a thunderstorm. The rains fell on Axmoor, the hilly moorland which is a feature of West Somerset and North Devon. Axmoor was already sodden and the floodwaters cascaded down the moor filled with natural debris, sweeping into the village of Lynmouth. When the mud and trees formed a dam just above the village, a huge wave built up behind it. When the dam broke, the wave destroyed everything in its path. It was strong enough to bring down boulders and smash through doors, windows, and even walls. The River Lynn, which ran through the village, had previously been culverted to reclaim land for a business area. When the culvert filled with debris and rainwater, the river overflowed through the village. In the course of the night's carnage, over 100 buildings were destroyed or seriously damaged, along with 28 of the 31 bridges in the area. 38 cars were washed out to sea, 
More importantly, 34 people died and another 420 were made homeless. The Rhinish Tar, a local landmark, survived the initial onslaught, only to collapse the next day, causing a secondary flood. On the same night, in the neighbouring village of Filey, three scouts from Manchester lost their lives when the River Bray, which they'd been camping beside, overflowed. Investigations into the cause of the tragedy concluded that it had been entirely weather-related. A low-pressure area had formed into a weather front as it passed over the British Isles, causing the extraordinary rainfall. As the front passed over the hilly terrain of Exmoor, changes in pressure, known as the orographic effect, made matters worse. It was almost impossible in those days to predict such a disaster, since the satellite weather technology that we rely on today for weather forecasts was still in the future. It was not the first time that Linmouth had been flooded, although the earlier similar deluges had taken place way back in 1607 and 1796. Following the disaster, the village was rebuilt, with the river being diverted around Linmouth. The destroyed houses that were in the most dangerous area for flooding were never rebuilt, instead being replaced by a memorial. As the 50th anniversary of the tragedy approached, newly declassified government documents caused a storm of controversy around the Linmouth flood. There's lots more to come in this video, but please consider liking, subscribing to the channel and sharing. And please consider supporting my work with a PayPal donation. The link is in the description. Thank you. It emerged that the RAF had been running a secret cloud seeding experiment between 1949 and 52, known as Project Cumulus. When the documents revealed that cloud seeding had taken place all over southern England in the same week as the flood, conspiracy researchers put two and two together. A BBC Radio 4 investigative documentary uncovered worrying evidence. The Meteorological Office had previously denied that any cloud seeding experiments had taken place before 1955. Either they didn't know about Operation Cumulus, or were deliberately misleading the public. The documentary spoke to RAF pilots who had taken part in the operation, who confirmed that dry ice seeding had produced heavy rainfall within 30 minutes. RAF logbooks confirmed their story. Prior to the release of the documents, the Ministry of Defence had categorically denied ever commissioning cloud seeding experiments. The BBC also unearthed a 50-year-old radio broadcast that described salting runs carried out by a glider pilot named Alan Yates in Bedfordshire that resulted in a downpour 50 miles away in Middlesex. Yates said this at the time. I was told that the rain had been the heaviest for several years, and all out of a sky which looked summery. There was no disguise in the fact that the seedsman had said he'd make it rain, and he did. Toasts were drunk to meteorology, and it wasn't until the BBC News Bulletin about Linmouth was read later on that a stormy silence fell on the company. Strangely, the RAF cancelled Project Cumulus directly after the Linmouth disaster. Declassified minutes from a War Office meeting on the 3rd of November 1953 discussed the usefulness of cloud seeding. It was seen as a potential tactic for slowing down enemy troop advances or even dispersing radioactivity from a nuclear bomb more widely. The possible link with Linmouth was known at the time. Questions were asked in the House of Commons about liability or the prospect of compensation. Other memos of the time showed that the Ministry of Defence was concerned that a link may be established. At the turn of the century, the British Geological Survey set out to find any evidence of cloud seeding in the soils around Linmouth. They didn't find any there, however they did find silver, a constituent of silver iodide, a cloud seeding chemical, in the River Lynn. It was not conclusive proof, but it was intriguing. Campaigners have asked intermittently for a full inquiry into the events surrounding the Linmouth Flood, but in recent years, the controversy has faded from the public mind. 
Meteorologists of today have largely been scathing about theories that suggest the flood was anything other than a natural event. Running counter to this are the untruthful government denials about cloud seeding, the panic in the Ministry of Defence after Lynmouth, and the clear evidence that cloud seeding was taking place around this time. It's probably impossible to ever tell what really happened that night at Lynmouth, but given the record of governments in ever telling the truth about anything, we have to at least consider the possibility that an irresponsible military experiment may have played a part in, or caused, a tragedy that cost 34 lives. Operation Northwoods was a 1962 plan by the US Department of Defense that proposed a series of false flag operations against their own citizens. CIA operatives were to be deployed to stage and actually commit acts of terrorism against civil and military targets within the United States. The government of Cuba were to be blamed providing an excuse for a U.S. war against the communist-run island. Suggestions for staged atrocities included hijacking or shooting down planes, attacking boatloads of Cuban refugees, and carrying out random acts of terrorism in U.S. cities. Concocted evidence would then be presented as a justification for strikes against Cuba, Although the plan was ultimately rejected by then-President John F. Kennedy, the fact that it was even considered is horrifying. Northwoods could not be dismissed as outside-the-box thinking by fringe elements within the intelligence community. It was drafted by the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the U.S. military and signed by their chairman, Lyman Lemnitzer, in a document entitled Justification for U.S. Military Intervention in Cuba, brackets, top secret, which was then passed to Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara. The Joint Chiefs proposed that they would run both the covert and overt aspects of the operation. This request, presumably along with the obvious moral repugnance, would have caused it to be unacceptable to Kennedy. As the Commander-in-Chief, he would not only be responsible for the false flag operations, but would be ceding control of the project to the unhinged generals who had devised it. Rumours about false flag plans such as Operation Northwoods made it into the public discourse years after the fact, but were always flatly denied by the US military and government. Then in November 1997, the so-called conspiracy theorists were proven to have been right all along. The John F. Kennedy Assassination Records Review Board, a federal agency charged with releasing records that could be relevant to Kennedy's murder, declassified 1,521 pages of previously secret documents. Kennedy assassination buffs, hoping to find a smoking gun that would blow the assassination case wide open, were to be disappointed but we have their persistent campaigning to thank for finally confirming what was long suspected, that high-ranking elements within the US government were quite prepared to sacrifice innocent civilians to advance geopolitical objectives. The Northwoods plan appeared initially in an abridged form before being published in full online by the National Security Archive on the 30th of April 2001. It emerged that the entire U.S. government was interested in creating pretexts for military interventions against Cuba, and was casting around for what form they might take. The document release also revealed Operation Mongoose, a similar provocation plan, under the control of Brigadier General Edward Lansdale. Thoughts turned to the U.S. base at Guantanamo Bay, a historical anomaly from the 1898 Spanish-American War in which the US, in return for aiding Cuban independence, secured an option to buy or lease Cuban land for naval bases through an amendment to the Cuban Constitution. 
The amendment was repealed in 1934, and Castro considered Guantanamo an illegal occupation. A false flag here might prove highly credible, given the circumstances. Other plans included blaming any potential failure of the Mercury spaceflight, in which John Glenn became the first American to orbit the Earth, on Cuban technical interference. The Kennedy assassination buffs did find some grist for the mill in the document release. In a 16th of March 1962 meeting, Kennedy blanched at the Northwoods plan and informed Lemnitzer that, in any case, military action against Cuba was off the table. Lemnitzer was removed as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff soon after, although he was later shuffled to Supreme Allied Commander of NATO. A clear rift had now been established between Kennedy, who was concerned about Europe, and the generals and intelligence community, who were obsessed with the geographical closeness of communist Cuba, despite generally improving relations between Washington and Moscow. Whether their belief that Kennedy had gone soft on communism crystallized into assassination plots is a whole different ball game. The final unmasking of Operation Northwoods is telling and relevant to us all, not just people in the US. We are endlessly lied to by governments of every stripe. In the last few years, when we have been constantly told that governments act only to further our health and welfare, we would do well to remember the callous disregard for the lives of ordinary people that was displayed by the twisted minds behind Operation Northwoods. <laughs>